Yes, sir. This is the Championship Football Coaches Clinic podcast, sponsored by Reps First Reality, First Down Playbook, Rack Coach, Tip of the Spear, the Top Hopper Sports Workbook, Next Pick, and we are streaming on uh, Sidelines Sports Network. We have a very special guest today, Coach Rush Propes. We also have co-host Gerard Johnson, my former quarterback at Meadowbrook High School. He's the head coach at Caroline. Coach Probst, for anyone who does not know you, Coach, tell us a little bit about where you're from, Coach, and, and why did you get into coaching? You know, because I had really good high school football coach. I'm Rush Probst, and head football coach here at Bell City in Alabama, Northeast Alabama. Uh, you know, I got into coaching because of uh, I had the head coach, Reagan Clark, who's Bill Clark, former coach UAB's dad. Yes, sir. And so uh, Coach Clark was a phenomenal coach. We had a really good program on a little small town in Ohatch, Alabama. And it was a 1A program, and uh, everybody knew everybody. And uh, we had three good assistant coaches. And, you know, back then you played everything. You played football here, football, basketball here, basketball. And back in them days, we didn't have a baseball team, so everybody ran track. So, uh, and you played summer ball with some with the American Legion teams. And uh, so, the reason I got in, I guess, is their influence over me. Uh, I had a great uncle that had coached at Alabama. Woo! And uh, had been there eight years from, you know, back in from 1926 to 1933. Uh, he actually coached Bear Bryant. Wow. So, so when Coach Bryant was at Alabama as a player, his name was Clyde Shorty Probst. He was an all-conference player, a center. So coaching was in our family. Uh, and, of course, remember back in the 20s, you know, of course, I wasn't born until 57, but, you know, in the 20s, Alabama was very successful back in them days too. So yes, sir. everybody grew up following Alabama football. And, of course, my dad went to Alabama. Mm. and ran track. So the influence of Coach Bryant, my high school football coach, all those things sort of materialized. And I think a lot of us people growing up in rural Alabama wanted to be football coaches, emulate basically what Coach Coach Bryant was doing in Alabama. And then obviously their high school coaches being their heroes like mine was. Coach, you know, I'm so excited to have you on here. And, you know, I told Gerard, I, I said, I got Rush Probst coming on. And he was like, man, he was like, I, I, you know, I used to watch his TV show. So, I mean, Coach, I mean, there are people who change the game. And, Coach, you changed the game. How in the world did you ever get on MTV, Coach, with your football program? I mean, that – I mean, you were talking, there was really no internet like that back then, like it is today in YouTube, but that changed the game. It did. It did at Hoover. We were winning at Hoover High School. Uh, you know, these questions keep popping yeah. up. Before. Yeah. We'll, like, we'll get to the questions, Coach. You don't You don't have to answer it yet. We'll get to it. So what the question you just asked me? I'm Lord, I'm I was, I would, Coach, I'm, I was just blown away by how in the world did you get on MTV <laughs> with the two-a-day show that Gerard, who's 28, used to watch all the time. And, I mean, I people used to ask me all the time, hey, man, do you watch two-a-days? And I was like, man, I live two-a-days. Well, but all I these think, kids watched it. You know, we started out at Hoover and we were 7-3 first year. Second year, we won state title. Went 14 and won. The next year we got beat in the championship game in 01. Then we won it in 02, 03, and 04. So <laughs> at the highest level, well, all of a sudden we became a national brand. And, it, you know, we were right there in the top five nationally in every, in, in every poll. So all of a sudden, come after the 04 season, we won it four out of five years. You know, a group came to us and said, you know, coach, there's 50 schools we're looking at. Mm. pilot a program and they chose us uh after spring they did they came in and did a pilot program and 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 then after the spring they called and said look y'all are the one we're choosing uh out of new york actually mtv was based in new york and i thought guys that 
if, if, if the show would have been on ESPN, it would have never been as popular that it was because it, touched, it touched a group of people that had never watched football. You know, Amen. everybody, all kids back then were watching MTV. Just like when I grew up in the eighties, everybody watched MTV. Yeah. So it, 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 uh, it attracted a group of people, uh, that really got excited about football and especially high school football. And, you know, we became the media darlings and, and to make things a lot better, we won another state title. And mm. so, uh, and I think that helped us win a state title. The next year, I'm not sure it didn't hurt us and, and cost us the state title, but we got beat in 06 in the championship game. But Why do you up, think it cost you, Coach? I think the first year it really energized. Because what else was I going to tell my players? You know, we had won yeah. three in a row. We, all right, we, we went back to back. We three-peated. And then all of a sudden, what was I going to tell my team? They got <laughs> less four feet. I mean, so, but when the TV stuff came, and we became nationally known, it, it inspired our players and they didn't want to embarrass themselves on national TV. So it took us to a different level. The next year, I feel like in 06, we were free season ranked number one in every poll in the nation. And I feel like distractions came in uh, due to the show. Uh, I think the, the people maybe had wanted to add a little more drama to it than the actual yeah. football part of it. And I thought we didn't handle it well. And not to mention that, that Pratt Bull was a heck of a football team. They were ranked top five nationally too. So <laughs> we lost to them in the state championship game. And and uh, so it cost us not only state title, it cost us national title too. But, uh, but, but the MTV turned Hoover into already it was a national brand, but then it – it really said it. It galvanized that Hoover is the best high school football program in the country, and because everybody knew who Hoover was, and our money started pouring in from the residual part of being on TV. You know, the Nike contract, the uh, Coke contract, the you know, the, just the, the corporate dollar just increased threefold, and you know, we were the number one reality show. Uh, on TV, beating out Laguna Beach, and <laughs> and, then, and then I think that at the end of the day, you know, I mean, it, it, it became a huge deal. Everybody wanted to be a part of it, and we had people from all over the country, all over the country, uh, follow Hoover High School football. Yeah, yeah Coach, we, yeah, we've yeah, already me. got a yeah, we we've already got a bunch of questions here, Coach. Roll Tide, ask Coach Probes who was the better team. Hoover 04 or 05 or Colquitt 14 or 15, who wins between those four? I mean, this is a tough crowd, Coach. Lord, I'm going to make everybody mad. Uh, <laughs> oh. Coach, I, what's, Coach, what's new, Coach? <laughs> you're right, you're right. 05, Hoover was, was although 04 was the undefe only undefeated team I had at Hoover. Uh so I'm going to make Jared Bryant mad but, uh, in the 04 team, but I'd have to go with the 05 Hoover team uh, from a talent. And listen, we won this, no one challenged us. We won the semifinal that year, 38 to nothing. We won the state championship, 56 14. Uh, I mean, it was, a, we steamrolled through uh, that year. Uh, quarterfinal, I think we were up 42 to 6 at, 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 at the half. So no one in 05 could play with us. I think. The 05 Hoover team was the best team in the nation that year. I think we finished second, third, or fourth, but there's no no doubt 05 was the best team in the country. 14 and 15, I'd have to say the 2015 Colquitt team was the better of those two, although both were, both were undefeated, won 30 in a row in the <laughs> classification in Georgia. Uh, but I'd have to say the 15 team, and if you put the 05 and 15 team together, and they played. Woo, Lord. It's a field goal game either way. I, you know, I, I, I think it's pretty equal. I really do. I think that if you played that game 10 times, it'd be five for Colquitt and five for Hoover. Uh, I bet the one's not up there. The two best teams. Here's, here's, the, here's the best question. The two best teams are not up there. The 06 team at Hoover, the 2018 team at Colquitt were the most talented teams 
bar none. Mm -hmm. Talent-wise, they were the best two teams and both got beat in the state championship game. Yeah, Coach, I have – I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Gerard's from Richmond, Virginia. But we have a tremendous amount of respect for Alabama football. I got hooked up with the Alabama football chat guys and my friend Mike Spencer from uh, Fort Lauderdale. He, he played for Coach Bryant. Bruce Aarons recruited him. So I've had George Smith on. I've had Mike Smith from Virginia. And now we've had Rush Probst. So, Coach, pretty much east of the Mississippi, we, we've had some legends like yourself. And we're just so happy to have you on, Coach. Here, here, here's your next question from uh, the crowd watching. Ask him if he's ever been offered a head football coaching position in college, even if it's Division II. Would he take it if offered? Have you ever been offered, Coach? No, I've never been offered a head position in college football, no. Yeah, G Gerard, what, what's on your mind? I can see, man, you want to ask Coach something. I do, I do. So, Coach, not, I'm excited that you're on here with us. Like I said, I'm I'm Coach Gerard Johnson, um, new head coach at Caroline High School out here in a small town in Virginia called Caroline. Um, pretty similar to um, how you said y'all got Hoover, how you picked up Hoover and – I, I'm not going to say the turnaround part, but when I first got this program, uh, they hadn't won a playoff game since 1992. Last time they had been to the playoffs before last year was 2013. And we uh, we actually came out and won a playoff game. It was the first time they've won a game uh, in probably four seasons total. So first time they've won mm. a game in four years. Um, so we, we, we overcame a lot of struggles and we still working hard. But one, one question I have for you is, I heard on, on another podcast that you did, you said this is your seventh head coaching job um, or seventh head coaching job of you turning the program around. Oh, I wanted sure. to know what is uh, what are some of your must haves or some things that you have to have for yourself personally to turn a program around? That's a great question, Coach. I think the one thing is, yes, this is my seventh stop as a head football coach. Uh, all, all were in bad shape. Uh, this one may be the worst, though. Um, you, you have to recreate the identity of your school. Mm. You, have to re, you have to recreate. Everybody talks about culture, everybody. Mm -hmm. And I understand how important culture is. I get that part. But you have to create a identity different than they've had. So you have to do a complete makeover. Um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, like here, we've hired nine assistant football coaches on the varsity staff. Uh, I retained three of them. I, uh, I've hired four freshman coaches, uh, retained two, and I've hired two junior high coaches. So, you know, when you look at you know, what is that, 15 hires, that's changing the identity. So the kids, you know, I changed the color of headgear. I changed the, uh, I, you know, I didn't change the uniform year one because the uniforms are already here. It's too late. Right. But uh, we changed, we, so anything that you can turn over and make different for kids, and the smallest things matter to players. I mean, it, it, it can be from, um, how they lifted weights, to how they practiced, to how they present themselves, uh, you know. So there, there's a lot to do, but, you know, you have to change your identity. And then here's the key to it. Once you change the identity, you have to gain an edge somewhere. I don't care if you search hard, wide and far, you can find an edge somewhere, somewhere. And you got to find something that nobody else is doing. That's number one. Find find something in your program that you do that's unique to you, based on your identity, that you can do that nobody else is doing that helps you win. The second thing is, if other people are doing it, then you got to do it better. Mm. You got to be more efficiently. 
and, and in today's world, length of time is not the important thing. It's the efficiency in the time that you work. And so, you know, I tell every coach I hired, if I catch you looking at a clock, mm. catch you looking at a watch, and you're a clock watcher, and you're not going to last here very long. No. You, know, because, you know, we're going to work till we get it done, but we're going to work smart. Right. You know, we're going to be smarter. So, like technology, for example, there's things now in technology in every facet of the, of the game that you can use, and you have to find out what that is that you can use that, that, that's, that helps you become a better football team. And, you know, I'll give you a great example. You know, we, we, had, we had two drones, you know, and our two drones are our, is what we film practice with. Mm-hmm. You know, so not a lot of high schools out there, you know, they may be using drones, but they probably ain't got two. And then we still have got a, a video camera that we're using too. So there's not anything that we don't film on that practice field every day in the summer, every day in the spring. If we do it, we're feminine. Cool. And then if we're doing it, we're going to watch it to correct it. That's, that's, that's another way that you can gain a lot of ground because generally high school coaches – They'll, they'll practice, and they'll have a good practice. But then they don't want to spend the time, once the kids leave, on grading two things. One, you've got a great effort. You have to grade effort. And then you got to grade whether what you're teaching them is right and if they're doing it right. So there's, there's, a, there's an effort grade and there's a technique grade. You know, there's there's different grades and different aspects to the film that you're watching. Now, what does that take? It takes a hell of a lot of time to do that. And it's a long, tedious job, but it makes you so much better. Let me give you an example for tomorrow. Tomorrow's practice for us in the morning is our last day of June work. It'll be our 16th day, I think. In these four, we, we've gone Monday through Thursday, Monday through Thursday, Monday through Thursday. Now Monday through, well, Wednesday's today, so tomorrow will be Thursday. So on day 16, we'll come in, and we'll lift in the morning at 6.15. And then we'll get through about 7.15, and then we'll give them a little snack uh, when they come out of the weight room, and then they'll head to the field, and there'll be a loosening of individual period, and then it ain't nothing but competition. It's mm. it's it's half skelly uh, with five on four. It's one on one inside. It's seven on seven uh, pass pro. It's blitz pickup uh, perimeter blocking. It's uh, it's uh, nine on nine. Uh, it's uh, eleven on eleven situations. Everything with that that we'll do tomorrow and we film all of that. So when we get back on July 10th, we will go into the film room and we'll correct our mistakes. So, you know, tomorrow's a shorter day because it's the last day of June for us to work. Normally we get here at six o'clock in the morning. We have a snack at six fifteen. They weigh in, we have a snack at six fifteen and then we work to we start in the weight room about 6.30. We go to 7.30. They come out of the out of the weight room, and we feed them breakfast. Then from breakfast, they go to film. From film, they go to walkthrough. Walkthrough, they go to practice. Practice, they go to uh, conditioning. And then when they're off the field, we feed them lunch. They rest, and then we watch film, or we'll keep a group to – hone in on route polish, say, say we're using quarterbacks and receivers and route polish. So that's a full day. Um, you know, they're out of here by 12 o'clock, and, uh, but it's a six-hour day. And then, and then we'll be off for 10 days, and then we'll start back July 10th. Yes, sir. We're the same way in Virginia. With We have a dead period for July 4th. We got a ton of comments and questions, Coach. 0-1 Hoover was loaded. If I remember, quarterback got hurt in the playoffs. He did. 
And that's from Roll Tide. Chance Fawcett is a regular. He watches our podcast all the time, Coach. We've done 180 of these since January. NFL, college, and high, great high school coaches. Uh, Chance says, what do you look for most in an assistant? A guy that's innovative, a guy that's organized, a guy that is not a clock watcher. He brings energy and passion to our program. He has, we, you know, when I met with the staff back in April, the existing staff, I, get, I told all nine of them, I said, look, guys, I'm not here to fire you. I'm here. Hmm. You, have to, you, have to, you have to show me what your value is to this program. So you have to measure as an assistant coach's value to your program. Mm-hmm. And he has to bring value to your program. If he's not bringing value to the program, then you got you don't have you got a hanger owner. And if you yeah, got a hanger owner, owner, you got a yeah. reason for the hanger owners. Hey, Amen. Coach, if you coach. see me on my phone, I'm taking notes. I'm taking a lot of notes. So that's all right. That's all right. That's <laughs> thank you, Coach, for this. I mean, this is great. It, it, the 2018 Colquitt team. What would he say is the reason that team didn't seal the deal? I believe they lost in the state championship to Milton High School, which yeah. had, had less talent. I don't know if this guy's taking a shot at you, Coach, or what with that, but hey. You know, I think I think that team, probably the most talented, just like the 06 team at Hoover, was extremely talented. And I think what happened, that team, that we played 15 games, in Georgia, we have a running clock once you get a 30-point lead in the fourth quarter, right, mm-hmm. in Georgia. I don't always agree with that, but we do. Twelve of the 15 games we played had a running clock in the fourth quarter. So what happened was in the quarterfinal that year, we're playing. We'd already gone to Grayson and beat a good Grayson team on the road at their place by two scores. That was the only co- close game we had all year. Well, first round, we blow it out. Second round, we blow it out. Quarterfinal round, we were playing the team that beat us on a Hail Mary um, in 2017, which that's a whole other story. Uh, but we beat that team 48 to nothing. I'm talking about blew them out. <laughs> and, I, and I'm telling you, that's the team that beat us the year before. I thought we played the state championship game that night. I think we made that game too big. Mm-hmm. We our, our stinger was out. We were too emotional, and we played a perfect ball game. That night, no team in America would have beat us. No team. There was not a team capable of beating the Calgary County Packers on that quarterfinal night at Mack Thorpe Stadium in, in South Georgia. But the next week, we play a semifinal game at home against Archer, and we had to beat them in overtime on mm-hmm. a block, PAT. So we lost our edge. So we go limping into the state championship game emotionally, I thought, and we didn't take care of business. Uh, we just didn't. And, you know, we had some unfortunate things that happened in that game where we had the ball first and goal from the one and don't score and get a field goal block. Yeah. And You're we, not going to win. You don't do that. Yeah, I mean, you, just, you just can't overcome those things. We also turned it over inside the 10 on the first drive of the game when we should have just been conservative and kicked the field goal. Any one of those two things happened, we walk away with that state championship. But we never played to the level that we played all year after the quarterfinal. It should have bit us in the semis. It didn't. And it bit us in the state championship game, unfortunately. Coach, I had some troll uh, comment on Twitter said, why are you having Rush Probst on? Well, I haven't had this many people comment and asking questions and watching. That's why. I mean, <laughs> golly, Coach. I mean, here's one for you. Daniel Beard, what are you thinking you liked and didn't like with the college coaches coming into your building to recruit your kids? What changes do you think need to be made on the college landscape in recruiting? That's one thing, Coach. I had a kid get injured at a camp. Some college, a college texted the kid to come to camp, and he had a major knee injury, and no coach or trainer was there to help him. So if they wanted him to come so bad, they didn't even know that he hurt his knee. So, Coach, what what, what do you think about this question? I think it's a good question. I think these college coaches don't give a rip about us, and, and it's very, it's very, uh, it's very obvious into the fact that you know. 
they don't even go through the coach a lot of times. <laughs> And they do with me because they're, they're not. Well, I'm not sending a kid to camp. They're not going unless unless that college coach goes through me, you know. And you know, you got to stop that crap. So, and, coach, what, what for a kid to come to camp? Is there got to be an offer on the table, or are you just old school where these guys better know whether the guy is good enough from the film and from the watch, transcript? Watch, watch them film. Watch film. I mean, they don't have. I mean, I, look. I, I get that, you know, the prospect camp maybe for some kids, but camp has hurt way more kids than it's ever helped. Man. Way more camp. They're looking for a reason not to recruit them. He didn't yes. run fast enough. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. coach. I know, I, know, I, know, I know a running back that's in a local school around here uh, that's been to every camp known to man this summer and done nothing but hurt himself. And if he hadn't gone to camp, and made him come recruit him, he'd probably have some legit committable offers. Mm. And it's just, I mean, I'm just telling you, they they don't, they've gotten away from the respect of the high school coach. And, you know, and I think all this communication without us is wrong. Yeah, and coach. This is wrong. I, I agree, and I got into it with some guys, and the guys that got into it with me, they're sleaze balls. Because the only thing in Virginia I want to happen is one, I don't want a college coach to tell our kid to come to camp unless there's an offer on the table. That there's a chance that kid, and they're just not doing it to make money off these kids. The second thing is, coach, and I'm gonna ask you this: Who runs the state of Alabama? Is it the college coaches or is it the high school coaches? No, you know, Coach Saban actually does a pretty good job of that, and I think Hugh will too. Yeah, because Hugh's been a high school coach, so Hugh understands. Now, I think I didn't think Harson understood, uh, but Gus did, um, and I think Hugh will because they've been high school coaches, and I think Coach Saban does. You know, he, he's a guy that I still think. You know, treats the high school coach with respect. Um, you know, I, but but in this state of Alabama, the high school coach is still is still revered as a very special person. Who and uh, man. and I think that that's you know the high school coach run the high school programs in this state. I, I think now there's no question. You know, Coach Saban has done a phenomenal job at Alabama, but us old guys like me and guys that are in our 60s or you know maybe in their 50s for that matter or 70s you know we were in this state when bear bryant controlled the state mm. you know and and so we we've seen this song and dance before with coach saban i mean no one was more fi- powerful in our state than bear bryant and mm. uh you know none and and that includes coach saban i think you know he's he's a very good football coach uh maybe the best to ever do it uh, and he still gives respect where his respect is, and that's, I think he, he takes care of the high school coach as best he can. I know the rules are different, um, you know, but again, when you're in Coach Saban's shoes and you've got 50 dang, or not 50, 25 five-star players and hundreds of four-star players beating your door down, I can see where he has to bring some guys into camp to get a feel for them because uh, that is a little bit different. But um, so it, it's, a, it's a two-edged sword, to be honest with you. You know, I, I get it. But some of these guys, uh, not Coach Saban, but some of these guys, uh, they don't have respect for high school coaches. Mm. Who is the best player, Coach, that you've ever coached? I remember Chad Jackson, he says, is still the best wide receiver I've seen in high school. Yes, like Chad would have to be in the top three, four, or five. I mean, obviously John Parker is probably the best quarterback I've ever coached at Wilson. He played quarterback at Alabama. I think, uh, you know, uh, Cam Irvin is probably the best lineman, offensive lineman I've ever coached. He was, uh, you know, he was a 19th pick in the uh, 2015 draft. From Alabama. Uh, still playing for the Carolina Panthers. Um, you know, going into his ninth year, I think it's his ninth year. Uh, probably best D lineman could be either Josh Chapman or uh, played five years for the Colts and and Kerry Murphy, five star parade All American, or Antoine Odom, 
who was an All-American at Alabama, played nine years in the NFL. Uh, so, in category, you know, categories, you know, running back-wise, although Dejon Edwards, he was a running back at Georgia that carried them last year, was a great running back for me at Colquitt. Uh, Saheem and Tevin King were great backs for me. Uh, Saheem went to Kentucky. Uh, both of them were 2,000-yard rushers. Uh, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just both of them in the same year, coach. Two no, thousand. Uh, uh, one, one was in ten, and one was in fourteen. Brothers, uh, and and they were great running backs. But uh, I told you the quarterback. I told you the running backs, uh, receivers, linebacker, linebacker, and DB. I think it's the only thing you didn't hit on, coach. You know, Jay Ward was great. You know, just got drafted from LSU from Colquitt. Uh, yeah, Corey Reamer. Uh, played for Alabama, played for the Jets for a little bit. Um, more of an outside linebacker. Inside linebacker, it's going to be hard to argue. Uh, Curtis Dawson, who signed at Alabama, uh, never really played there, but was a hell of a high school football player. Uh, probably yeah, just – I've had a lot of good linebackers. Uh, Blakely Khalid kid that started at Tennessee. Um you know, John Probst, my nephew, was a hell of a player at Hoover uh, that, that went to Tennessee and played there. I, you know, there's there's been a lot of linebackers, uh, but the most dominant one would probably have to be probably Curtis Dawson was just a phenomenal football player at Hoover and probably Jaquan Blakely or, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of them. But uh, secondary-wise, either Jay Ward or Corey Ringer, Jai Ward-Daniels, who played for uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, so, there, you know, I've gone through it. I've had good kickers. Sure. The kicker, Ryan Fitzgerald, who's starting kicker at Florida State right now. Uh, I've had 256 that have signed scholarships that have played for me in a 30-year period. So, jeez. Coach, I, did, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to go back um, a little bit, um, talking about the, you know, the whole recruiting stuff and, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, it's one thing trying to explain it to the kids, but it's another thing trying to help the parents understand it. What do you do to help or, you know, try to navigate the parents in the right direction so that they won't put their kids in the wrong position? You know, you may have a parent who may feel like, all right, this coach may not be doing enough for them. But essentially, is the kid is just not quite ready yet. How do you have that conversation with those parents about that? I'm as honest as the day is long when it comes to that. I tell the parents, you don't do anything, you know, don't make a decision in recruiting without running it by me. I try to educate them. I was on the phone last night for 30 minutes with our running back here about the recruiting process. Uh, Communication is key for parents. Be honest with them. Don't feed, feed them a, a, a don't feed them a bunch of lies or or promises that you can't keep. Uh, honesty is always the best with them, and in, in transparency. I really believe in transparency. So, um, you know, like kids will come up to me and have come up. Well, coach, I'm going to Auburn for camp. Why are you going to Auburn for camp? They're not going to recruit you. They're, you're not an Auburn player. You have to be that honest with them that, you know, I tell this kid, look, you know, you're wasting your money to go down there because you're not on their radar. And so I try to head off some of those issues before it starts. And sometimes they don't like it, you know, when you tell them the truth. But I've just found over the years it's better to tell them the truth and them get mad than you lie to them and build them up and say, man, yeah, you go and, you know, I'm going to try to hit you and, and yeah, you know, you need to go to Auburn and they get this false sense that they're going to be recruited by Auburn or whoever, it don't have to be Auburn. And then it doesn't happen. Guess who they're going to blame? They're going to blame us. Yeah. So I try to be as honest as I can and try to say, now look, maybe you don't need to go to Auburn, but maybe you need to go to Jackson State. Right. Maybe you're, Maybe that's where you fit. So I think we all need to have a gauge of which each kid can play and then place him in the best situation that gets him recruited. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, 
my friend Shane wanted me to ask you, Coach. He is a big Tony Franklin guy, and we've had Tony Franklin on. We've had Chip Lindsay on. He wanted to know, when did you first meet Tony Franklin, Coach, and when did you go to his system? Uh, spring of 1998, Tony came in my office in, Alma, in, in Mobile, Alabama, Alma Bryant, uh, Bayula Battery, uh, early May of 98 is when I first met Tony, and uh, we've become friends since then. Um, sometimes it's been a love-hate relationship, but, <laughs> but uh, sometimes we have different philosophies on things, but but I, I love Tony to death. I think the world of him. He's one hell of a football coach, and and you know I can't say nothing good things about Tony. And we we you know I've helped Tony. He's helped me. Um, we you know I owe, I owe him a lot too. Now I owe Tony a lot in my career, and so I'll always be indebted to him. Also, why is that, Coach? Why well, why do you owe him a lot? Well, he took me in when I was changing systems and. You know, and he, he could have treated me like a normal high school coach and give me a little bit of – but, I mean, I was there. I had a private plane, and I could get to Lexington when I wanted to. And, hell, I was staying in Lexington more. I was staying in Hoover. And uh, You had a private plane, Coach? Yeah, we had a private plane at Hoover that we could get where we needed to go. It wasn't mine, <laughs> but, but it was uh, our system and uh, booster there in Hoover that allowed us to fly whenever we needed to. So I could call him up and say, Don, I need – I need to play for tomorrow. Hey, Don, I need to play Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. No problem. You know, as long as I gave him 24-hour notice, he would have it ready, gassed up, and let's go. And uh, I spent a ton of time in Lexington when Tony was there and learned the system inside and out and was probably one of the original high school teams that 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 ran the air raid system. And, uh, and, and Tony was good to teach me all the ins and outs of it. I mean – you know, Mummy gets a lot of credit, and, you know, Hal's a great coach, and Leach, and I did spend time with Leach. I did spend time with Hal. I did spend time with, you know, a lot of those guys, Chris Hatcher, a lot of time with Chris Hatcher, but none, no more than I did Tony Franklin. Tony Franklin, I, I spent tons of time, and when he got fired at Kentucky, I hired him as a consultant at Hoover. He worked with my team in 01, 02, 03, and – he would come in the summer, and I'd pay him four and five thousand dollars for a couple of weeks, and um, he would consult and help us and evaluate, and and you know, and I may do that now, you know, with him. Yeah, uh, coach. You know, it's 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 always good to get people a second set of eyes and a second set of of, of opinions, and because he's brutally honest, he believes in what he what he says, and he does what he's going to say. Um, Amen. And he, and that's you know, there's not a lot of those guys out there anymore. Tony's a true guy, and and he will tell you what you need to hear. And sometimes you don't like it, but I've come to find out he's been right 99 percent of the time. That's a true friend. I mean, that's love. Yeah, I mean. Exactly. And, and you know, when I came down with cancer, if it hadn't been for Tony Franklin, I'm not sure I'd be sitting here today because. His ability at that time, uh, because of his cancer experience, he put me in contact with the right people wow. to get me treated. And uh, wow. if, I, if Tony hadn't come through recruiting one of our players, I'm not sure that I would have gotten to the right treatment and may not be here today because what I have is stage four throat cancer. So, wow. uh, so uh, like I said, I owe Tony a lot. Uh, amazing story, Coach. I don't know if you've ever – said that before but man i never knew that coach i mean yeah. the jeremy pruitt story about him wanting to coach for you at hoover gerard are you familiar with this i'm not familiar with that one. Oh my gosh coach this is a good one coach he That's comes cool. and begs you to coach at hoover that he ends up being a defensive coordinator at alabama head coach at tennessee coach uh coach probes can you tell that story because gerard's not even familiar with it no, coach. I'm not. well the tree that I've had under me is, is enormous when it comes to college coaches because my first defensive coordinator at Hoover was Bill Clark, yeah. head coach at UAB. Yeah. The next coordinator was a guy named Kevin Shirley who left me after 01 and went to Valdosta State. The next coordinator was Todd Watson, who's now the uh, coaching at Alabama. 
The next coordinator after that, the next coordinator after that, Jeremy Pruitt, who became, I hired Jeremy to be the DB coach, special teams coordinator. And then after Todd left, become a head football coach at Foley, I promoted Jeremy as the defense coordinator, and he was my coordinator in 05 and 06. So he stayed with me three years. Then he was hired in Alabama uh, in 07. Um, and then, and then uh, Kevin Shera took over, and Kevin Shera is now the coordinator at Georgia Tech. So that, that was my defensive tree. My offensive tree was uh, Kenneth Hand, became head football coach at Enterprise. Then John Gross, who just left Jackson State University and as head coach and is now at Clemson. Then Marty Roselle. Then David Faulkner. Uh, oh, no, excuse me, Matt Moore, who's now the offensive line coach at West Virginia. David Faulkner was after him, who just left West Virginia to take the head job at McGill Tulin in South Alabama. And then Chip Lindsey, who's now the offensive coordinator at North Carolina. That's just my Hoover tree. Man. In Caldwell County, I went from Jack Hines as a defense coordinator, who was uh, the architect at Auburn, secondary coach that that beat Spurrier in 93 and 94. He was our coordinator in 08, 09, and 10. Then I hired a guy named Travis Pearson, who's now at the corners coach at Troy. Then uh, – Tracy Buckhannon, who's now at Alabama and m Then it was uh, uh, Jeremy Rao, who's now at Caldwell County, but was at Georgia Southern and at Troy. For He won five conference championships at Troy and just left uh, Georgia Southern and is now back at Caldwell County. And then a boy named uh, Bubba Walker, who I hired away from Valdosta State. And then, of course, uh, Jeff Kent. And now... And here I have a guy named Nick Hardable who was at UAB as the D-line coach uh, and played at Alabama and who's my defense coordinator here. Offensively, I've had – yeah, Caldwell was a lot of a lot with me, you know, and, and I had people like Jeff Hammonds and Sean Sutton and Joey Bennett. But Joey Bennett, who's been with me for 15 years, is my offensive guy. But, yeah, I've got a tree and I've got a lot more. Josh Crawford, who's a wide receiver – coach at uh, Georgia Tech was my receiver coach at Caldwell County. So I think I've had 28 guys to leave me and go on and coach college football. 28. What do you think been the, uh, the biggest dip? Or what do you think has been, you know, the one thing that makes those college coaches come in and say, I want to put this guy on my staff? Well, I think they trust my judgment they know that I run a college program in a high school setting. So they know that the guys who work for me have been grinding. They know that they know how to work and they know that the things that we do are, are you know, maybe it's not a college program, but it, it acts like it a lot of times. And, uh, and, I, and I think they know if they can work for me, then they sure work for them, you know, from a standpoint of work ethic, because, you know, we do grinding now. I ain't gonna lie. We, we work hard and, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard grind. And, um, but, you know, I've hired good people. I, you know, they, they come in and do a job and then they promote themselves and, and, and go be college coaches or either high school head football coaches. So, you know, somebody, you know, the one thing about college for me, you know, I mean, I made a couple of mistakes, you know, I should have, I should have taken the, the job with Gus Malzahn in 2013. He did offer me a position at Auburn. Uh, I had four kids in college at one time. And I was making about close to $300,000 as a high school football coach because I was getting retirement in Alabama and I was a very well paid at Caldwell County. Well, I looked at the money of those kids, my four children, and they needed every dime of the money, but I didn't want them to be burdened with a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, one of them's got a $17,000, that's it, as far as a student loan, and another one's got, a, I don't know, thirty or $40,000, but the other ones do not. And uh, I didn't want them to be buried with hundreds of thousands of dollars of loans. And so I turned down Gus because 
he first offered me the job at 175000 Well, I was willing to take a $100,000 cut. But when the, AD, <laughs> when the AD got involved and dropped it to one hundred five, I couldn't do it. No. I didn't do it. And it was a mistake because guess who I told Gus to hire? He hired Chip Lindsey. So I told him, hey, there's a guy at Spain Park High School I think you need to hire. I'm not going to take it. So he goes and hires Chip. And you, you know what he's done. He's been yeah. the OC at Arizona. He's been or Arizona State. He's been the OC at Southern Miss. He's been the head coach at Troy. He's been the OC at Auburn. Been the co OC at Central Florida. And now he's the OC at North Carolina. So, uh, you know, I can only imagine what if that had been me. You know, and, Chip, and Gus has said that to me about 50 times. <laughs> Russ, you should have taken that job. You, you should have. Uh, uh, and really, maybe I should have. Maybe I should have bit the bullet and taken it, and there's no telling where I'd be today. But you know what? I'm happy where I'm at. I make good money. Uh, I'm happy. You know, I've, I've you know, got my young kids. or i got a son that's going to West Georgia to play football. I'll have a senior daughter here at Pell City, and I'll have a junior son on our football team receiver. So I get to coach him. I get to be around them. Uh, I'm running, a, you know, this is my last hurrah in high school. And, uh, you know, I'm going to get this thing turned around and we're going to compete for championships. And here in about seven or eight years, I'll hand it off to somebody else. Yeah, coach, what what did Jeremy Pruitt do, Coach, for you to hire him? He was a guy that was persistent. <laughs> Listen and to this, Gerard. Listen to what he did. He, I already had another guy in mind. I didn't know Jeremy. I had another guy. I'd already told another guy that I was going to offer that I had offered him a job, you know. And so finally, Jeremy was calling my house and leaving messages and me leaving. I'm talking. He, he would leave three and four messages a night, and then he would uh, he would he would wear my phone out at the office. And I'm avoiding, avoiding them, avoiding them, avoiding them, avoiding them. And finally, after a couple of weeks, I said, damn, this guy, <laughs> what, what, he, he don't know how to take no for an answer. <laughs> and so finally, he, I mean, he even camped out in my yard, um, you know, and said, look, when he comes home, I'll just, I'll get him. But uh, he, you know, Jeremy is, that's, that's just Jeremy Pruitt. So, Finally, I said, okay, come on in. I'm going to interview you. And I was just going to talk and interview him and move <laughs> on. Yeah, I was, that's all I was going to do. We get in the interview process with Todd Watson. Todd was my DC. And uh, we take him in the office, defensive office. It's about 15, 20 minutes goes by. And uh, I said, hmm, wait a minute now. So we go through the process. And after about an hour, I get up. I go to my head coach's office. I leave him with Todd in the defensive office. Well, after about 30 minutes, Todd sticks his head in my office and said, hey, boss. He said, what are you going to do now? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you know what I mean. He said, that's why they pay you the big bucks. And because it's not even close. This other guy that we've offered the job to ain't, ain't Jeremy Pruitt. And I said, no, he's wow. not. So this guy had already told his team. This other guy that I'd offered the job had already told his team that he was leaving. So I had to call his superintendent. I called him back and said, look, man, I got to rescind the offer. And he said, what? He said, I've already told my team. I said, I'm sorry. It ain't been official here. Uh, you know, it ain't been board approved, and I'm just pulling the offer. So wow. I called his superintendent. <laughs> look, I made a mistake. I hope, I hope, he had, I hope you can hire him back, which they did. And uh, and the rest is history with Jeremy. I mean, he came in and made an immediate impact uh, in special teams. We actually beat Bill and them in the state championship with three block punts, and Jeremy Pruitt was special team coordinator and and, and derived the plan to do that. So, you know, I knew I knew early on after that interview that I had a special coach in Jeremy Pruitt. Here you go, Coach. What's more competitive, Alabama high school ball? Or Georgia? You know how many times I've been asked that question a million and one. So I'm going to answer it a million and one times. I think Georgia, in the largest classification, has more of a competitive balance mm -hmm. as far as there's just more 
teams. That Not everybody play. wins it the same year. I mean, it's just, it's uh, a different team. There's it's it's there's there's sixteen to twenty teams per year in in seven A Georgia that can win a state title. Yeah. At least that sixteen. So after the first round, when you get the <laughs> second round in Georgia, and there's sixteen, to, any one in sixteen can win it. Now I know Man. there's some that are better than others, but your second round game is a war. In Alabama, I remember sleepwalking through the first and second round. I mean, we didn't even have a competitive game in round one or round two. It was quarterfinal, semifinal, final. So in Alabama, right now, you're looking at four or five teams that can mm-hmm. win seven, eight. That's it. You know, you're looking at Thompson. You're looking at maybe Vestavia, maybe Thompson. Hoover. Um, in the south, central Phoenix City, Auburn, that's it. Five teams. There's five teams in that state or in 7A football that can they can compete for a state championship right now in Alabama that I think legitimately has a shot year in, year out. In Georgia, like I said, 16, 18, 20 teams. So the difference is in 7A ball, it's just more they're just more good teams. But I think after that, when you get the 6A ball in Alabama, 6A ball in Georgia, or 5A, 4A, 3A, 2A, 1A, uh, I think Alabama and Georgia is pretty equal. Now, 2A in Georgia is, is deep, too. Uh, you know, there's just a lot more teams in Georgia. A lot is, more teams. I, I was just wondering, is it because in Georgia, like, there's more – I guess I'd say politicians who make laws where they put more money into the football programs or, I mean, is it the money or is it the coaching or is it the players or is it everything? I think there's, I think the coaching in Alabama is, is good. If not a little better, I think there's a lot of good coaches in Alabama. now. Yeah. Uh, or it was when I left 15 years ago. Uh, but the difference is Georgia's population. I mean, okay. you'll, have, you'll have a hundred plus power five players in, in Georgia, where in Alabama you may have 30. So there's okay. a lot more players in the state of Georgia. And that's the difference is you've got a population of 10 million. There's as many people living in Atlanta as the old state of Alabama. So I think wow. – and, and here's the other thing. Georgia high school football used to be South Georgia. That's it. Atlanta wasn't a factor. You know, maybe Brookwood Parkview, that's it. But now in Georgia, everybody's good. Every, they have really – and then Kirby, smart, when he took the Georgia job, is a perfect scenario for him. Because high school football in Georgia is right now on fire, yes. on fire with players and good teams. Yeah. He's this tailored fitness ATL so I coached in Gwinnett County. We had more kids go to the NFL this year drafted the majority of states. That's right. Coach now, took the words right out of my mouth. There ain't no doubt. He's telling the truth. I mean – it is what it is. I mean, and there's just the population. There's a lot of good facilities. When you're looking at facilities over there, I mean, you've got a few facilities in Alabama, Thompson, Hoover, maybe Trussell a little bit, uh, Central Phoenix City. you got a few, but not like Georgia. I mean, Georgia's got there's, – there's already four or five teams over there got full-length 100-yard indoor facilities. And I built the first one. I built the first one in 2017, and, uh, you know, now they're everywhere. They're at Carrollton. They're at Lowndes, uh, Rome. Uh, you know, Valdosta's building one. Uh, there's plans to build them other places. You know, we're not talking about the 40-yard indoors. You know, you got a few of them in Alabama, uh, but I'm talking about the 100-yard indoors. They're like in college. I mean, they're, the facilities are unreal in Georgia. So, yeah. Coach, like – High school coaches, talking to the high schools out there, being Rush Probes. I mean, Coach, you're probably one of the most famous high school coaches in America. What do you say to the high school coaches that are watching out there? You know, they might not make that much. I mean, in Florida, the coaches don't get paid much. In Virginia, they don't get paid much. I don't think North Carolina. But, you know, what do you have to say to the high school coaches? What advice would you give them, Coach, coming from – you know, a coach that's been around and is a legend. You know, I came, I grew up in Ohatchee, Alabama, small one-eight rural town. 
52 ball players. I coached 12 years of small ball. I, I coached at Heflin High School. I coached at Asheville High School. You know, I made my first head job. I was making $29,000 a year. So I would say to the high school coaches, you know, follow your dreams. And, and, and listen, move if you're passionate as I am about football and coaching <laughs> football, move to where football is important. Move to where football is important. Because if not, you're always going to be frustrated. And and a lot of people get out because of frustration. So Rush Brooks is not going to coach nowhere where football is not important. Now, Man. did I have to pay my dues? Yeah. Did I line fields, clean commodes, cut grass, sprig practice fields, paint field houses, do gym floors, seed baseball fields in, in at Christmas Eve? Yeah, I've done all that, every bit of it. But at the end of the day, you know, I did all that because I loved to work. But I also looked at it, look, one day I'm going to find me jobs that can pay my family, and I'm going to move to where those jobs are. So I made tough moves. The first move I made as a football coach, I'll never forget it. I'm at Asheville, my first job. 92, we get beat in the semifinals. On, and had a touchdown call back to win the game. I mean, I was devastated. Well, <laughs> my dad, my dad was dying of cancer. Mm. He, had, he had stage four stomach cancer. I watched my dad that year in 92 love every game we coached. Mm. He was at every game, man. He he would come in that field house, hug my neck, tell me how proud he was of, of, of his son. You know, and I think that him – Growing up as an only child, having an uncle that coached at Alabama, him being a track runner at Alabama, him fighting at World War II at Iwo Jima and Okinawa, all those, he was proud of me, Lord of mercy. And I loved my daddy. I miss him every day. I had to take a job, and I'll never get it. You fall a job, I go down there, and I'm talking to you, fall about the job. I feel like I'm going to get the job. And then they offer me the job. I've struggled. I didn't sleep for two days, three days. Man, I, I said, man, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so I called my daddy up. No, I didn't. I went to see him. I went to see daddy, and I said, daddy, this was spring of 93. Yeah, spring of 93. We just finished up, he and I, fishing and uh, crappy season, and I hadn't seen him in a couple of weeks. And I went to his house. I said, dad, I don't know. I, I can't leave you, man. I, I You're, you're – you ain't got much time left. You may have a year left. And he stopped me in mid-sentence. He said, son, you're not staying here on my behalf. I'm going to be dead in a year. And then what are you going to do then? He said, you're going to take this job. I'll get down there when I can see you. But you're taking the job. So I took the job. And it was hard, man. That was the hardest move I ever made in my life. because. And then he died the next year. Well, that first year, he, he saw all the ball games in 93, but he struggled. And then in 94, he passed out in the stands game two and died in the week of game four. So, uh, and here's what's crazy, man. He dies on a Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. He dies on a Wednesday. I fly up on a Tuesday. Uh, well, I didn't know they'd been flying me up every week because he died during football season. Well, I drove up with my family. I get there three or four hours before he dies. Uh, I get there, and it's about an hour and a half before he dies that morning, on Wednesday morning. I remember him looking me up and grabbing my hand and saying, Son, you don't move at funeral. If you move at 11 o'clock, and that way you can get back and coach the game Friday night. And this Man. ain't gonna lie. He died an hour and a half later. And sure enough, we buried him at 11 o'clock on Friday, and I hopped on the plane later that afternoon and flew to Troy, Alabama to meet my team. And I coached in the game that night, and that's what he wanted. Yeah, football is important. Yeah, I football mean, it, is important. Yeah, and he, football is important. But you know what? I would do the same thing to my, my kids, too. I don't want to be a burden, and I don't want to affect their decisions in life, you know, as, as a, you know, and I think that's where coaching comes in and, and the toughness of 
that coaching and football brings to us as people, you know, I, I think I go back to my high school coaches and my college days, you know, if I hadn't gone through some of those things and some of those trials and tribulations, you know, I'd have whimpered up, man. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have followed through as my daddy wanted me to. So that that's, that's what it was. And that's what, that's what drives me today is, is I think him and being my hero and, and my high school coach, Raven Clark and the influence of Bear Bryant and, Man. And all those kinds of things is what is what molded us. I'm not yeah. the only one. I'm not yeah. the only one. There's other good high school coaches in this state that are my age. Most of them are retired. Uh, but there's a few still left out there. And uh, Terry, Terry Curtis comes to mind. Um, you know, he's over a 300-game winner. And I think, you know, we, we've talked about it from time to time. And, you know, what keeps driving us? What What drives coaches? You know, I think as Coach Saban says, we've always been a part of a team. Mm -hmm. And 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 this everyday grind, I enjoy the grind. I yeah. enjoy the hard summer work, the all season grind, and the, you know the games are games. They're they're okay. I like I like the Saturday morning after we played all the sixteen hour Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> To get ready for the next game. Yeah, that's, make I a pot of coffee. Yes. It's eleven p.m. Let's go. Yes, I mean that—that's what drives me as as a coach is is the grind, and, and I think it, and I think it, I think it drives Coach Saban. I think it drives Coach Belichick or Pete Carroll. Those guys, I, I, you know, why are they still doing it at seventy-one years of age? Man, um, you know, and I think it's we've all. You know, I'm sixty-five. We're all been. Uh, part of a team for so long this is i'm going into my 42nd year and uh and i took two years off so um so I, you know i've been around the game a long time and um i'm happy to be back in it yes sir did bear bryant know how big of an impact he had on the state of alabama because my friend mike spencer told me that it was lonely to be bear bryant i mean because he was like, I guess it's like you're a movie star. Like, oh, there's coach. Coach is coming. You could you could hear his shoes. He said, and he he told me a real funny story about there was a a guy in the meeting room and and Coach Bryant was getting ready to walk in and uh, one of the freshmen goes, the old man's coming, and like one of the linebackers looks over and goes, Poom. and then he, he like, yeah, coach. The old man's coming. He got beat down for that. It's like 19, probably 79, coach. Yeah, I mean, what, what, how big of an impact did that man have? Golly, I, I think I think enormous. I think the impact that Bear Bryant had on coaches is enormous. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he was bigger than life. Yes, I mean, and I think you not only me that all that era of us that you know it grew up in the seventies uh, in college and high school and watched his golden years. You know where he should have won two or three more, you know, it got taken from him in 66. It got, you know, they fumble in 80 and uh, that or they had a three peated and, you know, 81, mm -hmm. they were loaded. So, um, I, but Bear Bryant was bigger than life and he influenced a lot of people, a lot of high school coaches and a lot of us, not, I don't want to say the word emulate him, you know, I'm not saying that we wanted to coach at University of Alabama, but if you were in coaching in Alabama, you know, I started in 1980, actually, but 81 was my first coaching teaching job. So I was on the end of his tenure. Uh, but when I was in college, uh, he was rolling, man. They were they were winning national championships. I just think I look back on those years and the man could say anything and you took it to the bank and you listened to him like he was some religious leader to be honest with you. And I think that's, he had a huge influence on a lot of us in and out of coaching. I mean, uh, business people alike. I mean, everybody reared Coach Bear Bryant. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, coach D. Williams down here, he, he's uh, a high school offensive line coach, a young coach. He played. He graduated in 2015 from West Alabama. He coaches at Hazel Green, and he watches all the clinics, Coach. And he just says, good afternoon afternoon, and welcome to the podcast. 
Coach Probst. Isn't this awesome, Coach Williams, that we have Coach Probst on? Gerard, what's on your mind, man? I can tell you're thinking. I got one more question for you, okay. Coach, and then I have to step off and go uh, make sure them guys know what they're supposed to in workouts. <laughs> <laughs> He wanted to get yeah, dedication. Gerard, you got to get him in the morning, man. You got to make him so he get up at five thirty and mid. We got we got two groups, so I got I'm in the area where some of them guys they work. So in the morning time, so I got two groups. I got an eight to eleven group and man. a five to seven group. You burning the candle from both ends, man. Ooh, I can't do that now. I mean, you've done it before though, haven't you, Coach? I haven't done it before, but I yeah, you know, we all have. You got to get him some jobs, man. Get him some afternoon jobs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to get them. I'm trying to get them right. I'm, I'm definitely we we putting a plan together for next. You gonna year, ask so. him about fundraising, Gerard? He's in a small uh, town, Coach. What you gonna no, ask him, Gerard? I won't go ask him about the fundraising. What I was gonna ask you, Coach, is you know uh, the kids that you coached over the years, the ones that have gone to college. Um, obviously, you know they've been talented, uh, but what is like the the non negotiables or one of the things that you notice that all of them had in them that that helped them be successful at the next level well some of them didn't start out real good um cam Irvin in the 17th 19th pick browns uh didn't want to play football he was thought he was gonna be a basketball player Ed yeah. one of them, uh late first round pick of uh, the Cincinnati Bengals uh, was playing basketball in Mobile. Didn't want to play football. Uh, I, I think, I think the non-negotiables to me are: look, it's going to be ebbs and flows. It, it is. They're not going to be as excited as you are and I am about football. They're just not. And it's like I got three linemen right now, or four. Oh, I got one DL. And I got three offensive linemen that are talented kids here in Pell City, but they've never worked. They've never pushed themselves like I'm pushing them right now. And it's a constant battle with the big heavies. And and to the point to where we're having to walk around the field with them because they can't finish their conditioning. You know, some people might want to just run them off because – they're not doing what everybody else is doing. But then I, I tell our coach, I said, look, man, this is a traumatic change for these kids. Yes. It's your job as a coach to push that button and find ways to push that button for each and every kid. And some kid, like our starting X receiver has not been here for the last two days. Now, if we're in year two, he's got a major <laughs> problem with me. But in, year, but in year one, I'm not saying he gets a pass, but he'll I'm going to make it up. But yeah, you'll get to make it up. And, yeah. and if, you know, now I'm not going to change the standard. Right. But I'm going to try to work to get him to that standard too. Right. So I think that's the thing you got to figure out when you go to these broke programs is you got to understand now these kids have not worked. They've not had winning in their mind. They football has been, not been in their forefront. Mm. So, you you gotta you gotta instill, and here's the thing I've started to do. We're all part psychiatrist, every one of us. If you're a coach, you're gonna be a part psychiatrist, or you're not a good coach. I even bring in another guy, and I pay him a little money, about fifteen hundred bucks, for about ten sessions, and I build some core values, like perseverance and resiliency and toughness and. All the whatever your core value, I have seven core values that we teach. Well, he's coming in and he's reiterating in his own way what I've already told him. So they don't even just have to hear it from you, coach. They got to hear it from you too. Your assistant coaches better be teaching the same thing. And then you better have another guy that comes in that they don't see very often, maybe every two weeks, and then he hammers home the same points. And it's just it's just psychiatry. You know, it's like Saban does with, with Coach Echo, you know, Eco, whatever his name is, the, the sports psychiatrist, psychologist. You know, we don't have $250,000 to put him on retainer, you know, but you can go find $1,500 to find a motivational speaker that, 
they can speak your same language. And that's, that's what we're doing. I mean, we're only on our, this week, we just finished our third core value. And then he'll come back in July and he'll hit the other four. That'll lead us into fall camp. And then he'll come back for two more sessions. Well, he'll come back and do a follow up on the seven for number eight. And then he comes sort of the third of the year. And then he comes sort of toward the end of the year to, to, to continue to drive them points home. And he does a good job of getting them to ask questions. And, and I'll tell you what I do with that too, coach, is I also build my leadership council off of that. And so I take notes and I see who's listening and how they're in, in, in interacting with him. And that's how I start to develop a leadership council. You have to have a leadership council. That in today's world, if, if a team out there don't have a leadership council, you know, made up of your of your best leaders and you're not sitting as a head coach around a table listening to their their thoughts their suggestions or in today's world i think we i'm transparent with them too i tell them why we do stuff that don't mean i tell them what they want to hear right but i'm telling them things that are the truth whether they like it or not, but I give them the opportunity to engage with me and tell me how they feel about things. And so it's just interaction with your players. I, I, and I look, I have my kids over on weekends. I cook for them. You know, I'll throw ribs on the, on the grill, hamburgers on the grill, barbecue chicken on the grill. Sometimes I'll have five, sometimes I'll have 15, sometimes I'll have two. I had two to spend the night with me last night. You know, I just think, if you're a coach, you're more than a coach. Right. And, you know, you got to be bought in 24-7, 365. And when your kids know that, we go pick them up. They're not here. We take them home. <laughs> we do it all. And so we feed them three times a day right now. And in, the, and in the fall, we're feeding them five times a day. So, you know, we spend about $50,000 on feeding our players. And, and that's us <laughs> cooking a lot of it. So – uh, you know, our kids call it at coffee. They used to call it Golden Corral too, man. And, uh, and it was good. And our kids really like it. And so we do a lot. We do a lot. And and so my wife's here every day. She works in the football office as a football secretary slash nutritionist. She's in charge of our nutrition program. Um, you know, we've got an academic plan. We've got a leadership plan. We've got. Uh, it's a very comprehensive program, guys, and it's just something that takes a lot, you know. And, you know, I released my assistant coaches around. Well, today they left here today about three o'clock. They got here about five thirty this morning. A lot of times they may be here to four o'clock, and then I'm here five, six, seven night uh, during the summer, and and then we come in on we come in on Fridays and work a half a day. Players don't come in on Fridays in June, but now in July, when they get back, it's five days a week. Yeah, you Gerard. Running, you running the tight show. I love, I love it. I, I, I took well, a lot of notes. Let me tell you this. When I was your age, when I was your age, I was I was 31 years old when I became head football coach. Man, I made so many dang mistakes. I didn't know what the hell I was doing half the time. And, and it took me, Coach, it took me – you know, 89, we go to the playoffs, got beaten the first round. The only first round loss I've ever had in my career. The next two years, I went one and nine. The next year, I went seven three. Wow. Did not make the playoffs. Then in that fourth year, we, we had a school record and got beat, lost state championship. And, uh, and then that's when I left when my dad was sick and, and took the follow job. And then, uh, uh, so, but I go to Ufala. I was there four years. So I've been in coaching eight years, head coaching. Still didn't know what I was doing. Because at the end of those eight years, I was 50 wins, 41 losses. I was just mediocre. But I'd been in small schools. It, as in a five, as seven years, I was an assistant. Eight years, I was an assistant. We'd been to one playoff game. That's it. And lost it in the first round at Asheville in 88. So I go to Ufala. We get beat in the second round. 
first year, beat the number one team in the state, number 17th ranked team in the country. That was my first marquee win. And then we go four and six, my dad dies. Then we go five and five, don't make the playoffs. Then that next year, we go we go to the second round again. Well, I leave and go to Mobile to build a new school. That year in 97, I changed everything. I spent a year of experiment. I changed defense. I changed offense. I changed the way we lifted weights. I changed what we were doing and everything we were doing. There was nothing at 55, let's see, we went five and four, at 55 wins and 45 losses, I said, you know, things have got to change. So I experimented, and we went five and four. <laughs> Next year. How many we, years have you been a head coach now, Coach? And you were still 30, going five and four. This is motivation, man. 31. I mean, this- 31. So there I am nine years into it as a head coach. I've been to one semifinal run, two second rounds, and one first round. I'm 55 wins, 45 losses. I'd won one, two, four playoff games and lost one, two, three, four playoff games, four and four in the playoffs. So then, like I told you, during that 97 year, I, I experimented with everything. So we go into 98 and we go to 7A, biggest, biggest classification. And we nearly win the state title in the school's first year. I became AP coach of the year, and I got the Hoover job, and the rest is history. But I was not too scared to make changes. I changed every aspect of everything I was doing from how we worked to how we lifted, how we conditioned, how we practiced, how we – I mean, everything. I went to shorter practices. I went to more up-tempo practices. I went everything different. There was not one single thing that I kept that I'd done in the previous eight, nine years. So it really changed a lot. And and then, of course, since 1998, you know, now I'm 80 – I think I've won 85 playoff games and, uh, and lost 13 uh, – or no, lost 17 – but uh, I'm 84, 85, and 17, I think. But I was four and four now at one time. So I think that you you can't be cha- you can't be scared to make a change. You can't be scared to try different things. You can't be scared to not be an innovator. And like I told you an hour ago, or however long it's been ago, <laughs> you got to be innovative. And you have to do things that something that nobody else is doing. You have to find out what that is, Coach. And it may be something small, but your kids will think it's something big, and they will that will sustain them. I promise you, it will sustain them. And I think, like the fundraiser stuff, I I don't do as much as I used to. So I'm I'm a little rusty on that part. We didn't have to fundraise at Crawford County uh, or at Bad Austin. Um, we're going to have to a little bit here to pay for all this food we're eating. This, this Texathon deal guys may be the real thing. I mean, I, I know teams out there, I, if we don't make a hundred thousand dollars in a Texathon, I'm going to be disappointed. Mm-hmm. So, and then our program ads, you know, if we're around the 150 mark and in, in fundraising, I'm good. Cause we'll spend 50, $60,000 in food, and then, you know, we put our team – here's another thing you do. Nobody does. You're on. Put your team in a hotel the night before the game. <laughs> Man, put that's big team. time. That put is big team. time. And you ain't got to put them all. Take your number ones and your number twos. Guys are going to play at least ten snaps or more in the game. Put them and the coaches in a hotel for focus. Take their phones away from them. Make sure the phones are off in their room. Put two to a room. Don't put four to a room. Spend about three grand, thirty five hundred dollars. Put them in there. Check in at six o'clock. Have a devotion for them. Have meetings, offensive meeting, defensive meeting, walkthroughs, whatever. Send them to the room about nine o'clock. 
you know, let them get their six o'clock check in, start your meetings at seven. And then at nine, send them to the room with more food. So I do a team meal at five o'clock. We do a team meal at five o'clock. Then we check in the hotel at six o'clock. Seven o'clock, we start meetings. Nine o'clock, we're done. 9.30 to get their, their snack, their sub sandwich or whatever they eat that, that night. 10 o'clock lights are out. We wake them up the next morning at 6.30 or 7 to give them a good nine hours of sleep. Total isolation. They can watch TV. That's it. Can't be outside the room. Can't be in somebody else's room. Uh, no, no talking to girlfriends. No talking to mama. No phone. No way to get out in touch with nobody. You get them up, you have a meeting, you put them on a bus, you take them to a church, feed them breakfast, have a devotion, FCA, camaraderie, bonding, start the day off good, breakfast, the bus in the school, get there right before his bell rings, send them to class. And then I promise you, your team will be more focused and ready to play. Because you know what? You've controlled their environment from the time they got there Thursday morning. Because when they get to Thursday morning, I've got a walkthrough. Then after that walkthrough, we feed them the best breakfast you've ever seen. And then we feed them a strategic meal all during the day on Thursday. And then a team meal on Thursday night or at 5 o'clock the, before they go to bed. So guess what? And we have a big meal for them on Wednesday night. So guess what? We control their environment from Wednesday night. 48 hours before kickoff, we control what they eat, what they drink, how they rest, and who they're talking to, all the way up to game time. That's and it's worked. That's and it's worked. Up. And it's worked. I'm just telling you, it's worked. And I've done it at Mobile. I did it at Hoover. I did it at Coffee County. I did not do it at Mount Austin because we did COVID, and we couldn't do that. We couldn't spend a night during COVID. But we're going to do it here at Pell City. So we're going to take 35000 of the booster money, and that's going to take care of the hotel. We're going to spend between fifty and sixty in food. And then the rest of it, uh, booster money is going to spend on banquet, uh, team camp. We're not going to team camp this year, but normally we'll take them to a team camp uh, that will cost fifteen or twenty grand, and then uh, And then prospect camps if they go. You know, the $50, $60 deals and then clinics for coaches. That's what your booster money's there for. It's not there to buy helmets and shoulder pads. So mm. um, anyway, that's uh, that's what we do. That's what we do. And, you know, I've told people for years and years and years that if you control their environment, you'll, you'll control their thoughts. And if you control their thoughts, they'll play better come Friday night. What the problem we got with our youth right now is hell, they can't discipline themselves. So they're on their phones at two in the morning. If you let them, they're talking to their girlfriend. They don't get enough sleep and they don't eat worth the crap. Mm -hmm. So you, you as a coach have to control that. And we do. That's next level. I, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that coach. Has he been awesome, Gerard? That, that's next level. I, I really, I, I done learned a lot today. I'm, I'm, more than excited that I, I actually had the opportunity to be on here with you, Coach. Thank you, yeah, guys. Thank you, you know, Coach. No, I just, yeah, Coach, I, I could spend I could spend the rest of the night on here talking to you, Coach. But I mean, God bless you, Coach. You're my favorite coach I've had on, Coach. I mean, you are a football coach, and if you love football and you love football coaches, you gotta love Coach Pros. So, Coach, what's the? Is there anything you we didn't go over? That you'd like to say before we press in? You know, you asked a question why if I'd ever been offered a, a college job, and I have, not a head coach job, would I take it if I was offered it? You know, I would consider it. There's no doubt. I, do, do I think I could do it? Absolutely. If Hugh Freeze and Gus Malzahn and, and Chad Morris and, and all these guys that, that if they, if, and Art Riles, if they can do it and win there, I promise you I can and yeah. Bill Clark. So I, I think, yes, I would do it. But you know what? I'm happy, happy, happy where I'm mm -hmm. coaching at right now. You know, I'm sort of at home and uh, 30 minutes down, that's where I grew up and my wife's at home. And 
we got a great place on the lake uh, that right. we just moved into and uh, or moving into tomorrow. Um, so, um, you know, so I, I'm in a good place in my life at age 65. But guys, I'm going to do this if I can. The good Lord allows me. I'm going to do this for another seven, eight, ten years. Well, I hope it works. I hope you do, Coach, because I'll be following. Don't worry about yeah. that. Well, you know, there's a question right I, yeah. I, I think so that's why I asked some of the best college coaches were great. You dang right they are. I think some of the best coaches out there in college football today were high school football coaches. I really believe that. I mean, I can name you 10 of them right now or, or more. And it's some of the most successful people out there were really good high school coaches because, you know what, high school coaches have had to do more. So we're not, we're not bogged down when we get stressed out, you know, over – having to do too many things because we've all had to wear so many different hats. Some of those college coaches ain't never done nothing but coach linebackers and coach and coordinated defense. So they, they don't know. They don't, they don't know all the other little things. And so, uh, no, I think I, that's the beauty about being a high school coach is you, there's not a day goes by and there's not a new adventure. Hmm. Not a day goes by. It's not a new adventure. So, you know, it, it's, uh, I think some of the best high school coaches out there are, are, are ex, are the best college coaches out there. Ex high school guys, I agree with that, and I pull for all of them. Me you know, too, I pull, coach. I pull for Art Browns. I pull for Hugh Freeze. I pull for Gus Malzahn. I pull for Art you know, Browns is actually coaching the team in Italy. Well, the team that I was playing for in Italy, coach Coach Browns um, coaching in the championship game in Toledo this weekend. Well, look what Texas does. They take care of their own out there. Look, look at Todd Dodge. Look at the guys that uh, uh, that the new guy at Texas Tech. He came out of high school, long time high school mm -hmm. coach. He's the head coach at Texas Tech now. And so, you know, there's there's just so many good ones out there that are that were good high school coaches that that I really do believe they they can sustain a program and and really do things because you know what. They'll be that guy that can find that edge quicker than that college guy that's always going to the transfer portal. <laughs> transfer portal. Lord. Man. Coach, thank you so much, Coach. I'm going I'm yeah, to keep it going. We're going to keep in contact. I'm going to press in, Coach. But we'll stay. I just want to stay on here for a second just to 